Did you know that over one in three adults in the United States has prediabetes and 80% don't even know it? Let's pause for a second. Could that be you? Or could it be someone you love? The truth is prediabetes is sneaky. It develops quietly, but if left unchecked, it paves the way straight to type two diabetes and all the serious health problems that come with it. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Richardson. Welcome back to Family Med. Today we're diving into a topic that's affecting millions of people, but often flies under the radar. That's prediabetes. Prediabetes means your blood sugar levels are higher than normal, but not yet high enough to be classified as diabetes. Specifically, it's defined by any of these following lab results. That would be a fasting plasma glucose between 100 and 125, a two hour plasma glucose between 140 and 199 after a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test, or a hemoglobin A1C between 5.7 and 6.4. So if you're in that range, it's a sign your body is struggling to manage blood sugars, but also means you have a window of opportunity to turn things around. So why does prediabetes happen in the first place? Well, it all comes down to a condition called insulin resistance. Let's break that down. When you eat, your body turns food, especially carbohydrates, into glucose and sugar. That sugar enters your bloodstream and your pancreas releases insulin, a hormone that acts like a key to help your cells absorb that sugar and use it for energy. But here's where things start to go wrong. Over time, especially with a diet high in processed carbs and sugars, and with too little physical activity, your cells will start to ignore insulin. And this is what we call insulin resistance. I like to explain it this way. Imagine an old grandpa sitting on the couch watching his favorite sports game. He's wearing hearing aids and his wife loves to chat, especially during the game. Grandpa, being a little focused, and maybe a little rude, doesn't want to hear the chatter. So what does he do? Well, he turns down the volume on his hearing aids. But grandma, not giving up that easily, she starts talking louder. Now, the more grandpa turns down his hearing aids, the louder grandma gets. This is exactly what's happening inside your body. Your cells, the grandpa in this story, start turning down their sensitivity to insulin. But your pancreas, the grandma, starts pumping it out more and more insulin, trying to get the message through. At first, this extra insulin keeps your blood sugar in check, but over time, your system gets overwhelmed. High insulin levels lead to weight gain, more inflammation, and yep, even worse insulin resistance. And there's another layer to this. The cells in your pancreas that make insulin called beta cells can start to wear out. They've been working overtime for so long that eventually they can't keep up. Now, as those beta cells begin to burn out, your body starts producing less insulin at the very time you need it most. That's when your blood sugars start to rise, first into pre-diabetic levels and then into full-blown diabetes if nothing changes. Now, here's a sobering part. About five to 10% of people with pre-diabetes progress to diabetes every year. And without lifestyle style changes up to 70% will eventually develop type 2 diabetes over their lifetime. But even before that happens, prediabetes itself is associated with a higher risk of heart disease and early death. That's why both the American Diabetes Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology recommend that all individuals with prediabetes undergo a full cardiovascular risk assessment. Things like blood pressure, cholesterol, and triglycerides often need attention too. So what can you do to reverse insulin resistance and fight prediabetes? Here's exactly what I recommend to my patients. First, cut out the biggest offenders. One of the most important steps is to reduce or eliminate refined carbohydrates and added sugars from your diet. This includes things like white bread, white rice, pastries, candy, soda, and pretty much anything highly processed. These foods are digested very quickly and rapidly convert into glucose in your bloodstream. Now that sudden sugar spike forces your pancreas to release a big burst of insulin to try and bring your blood sugars back down. Now, if you keep flooding your system with these fast digesting carbs day after day, your cells are constantly bombarded with insulin. And over time, they start tuning it out, just like we talked about earlier with our grandpa and grandma analogy. Second, focus on high fiber whole foods. Once you've started cutting out the process stuff, the next step is to build your meals around foods that nourish your body and support blood sugar stability. I recommend loading up on high fiber foods like non-starchy vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. These foods take longer to digest, which means glucose is released more slowly into your bloodstream. That helps avoid those big sugar spikes and reduces the demand on your pancreas to pump out extra insulin. For example, think about the difference between eating an apple versus drinking apple juice. The apple's fiber slows down digestion and sugar absorption, while the juice hits your bloodstream almost instantly. Plus, fiber just doesn't slow things down, it also helps feed your gut bacteria, which plays a role in reducing inflammation and improving insulin sensitivity over time. So a simple tip that I share, try to include both fiber and protein in every meal. That combo helps keep your blood sugar steady and helps you feel full longer. The third is move your body every day. Exercise is like medicine for insulin resistance. When you move your muscles, they soak up glucose without needing as much insulin. 
and that's huge. The American Diabetes Association recommends at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity. That's just 30 minutes five days a week. Add in strength training two or three times per week and you're on the right track. In fact, large studies show that people who commit to these changes can reduce their risk of developing diabetes by up to 58% over three years. Now fourth is aim for modest weight loss. Even losing just five to 7% of your body weight can drastically improve insulin sensitivity. Somebody weighing 200 pounds, that's just 10 to 14 pounds. So it's very achievable and makes a really, really big impact. So fifth, prioritize sleep and manage stress. Poor sleep and chronic stress raise cortisol, your body's stress hormone. And cortisol directly worsens insulin resistance. So aim for at least seven hours of quality of sleep and find stress reduction practices that work for you. This could be deep breathing, mindfulness, exercise, or simply setting better boundaries around your time. And sixth, keep up with your regular check-ins. Monitoring your blood sugar, A1C, and sometimes insulin levels can help track your progress. And because prediabetes often travels with other issues, your doctor should also check your blood pressure, cholesterol, and other cardiovascular markers. So let me tell you about one of my patients. Her name was Sarah. She came to me with an A1C of 6.2%, right in the prediabetes range. She was understandably nervous, but she was motivated. She cleaned up her diet by focusing on whole foods, made it a point to walk five days a week, and started doing some simple strength training at home. Within six months, her A1C dropped to 5.5%, back to normal. She also lost 12 pounds and reported having more energy than she'd had in years. And stories like Sarah's are not rare. They show just how important powerful, small, consistent changes can be. So to recap, prediabetes is incredibly common, but it's also incredibly treatable. The key is tackling insulin resistance head on with real lifestyle shifts cutting out refined carbs and sugars, focusing on high fiber whole foods, getting regular movement, aiming for modest weight loss, and managing sleep and stress. And if you're in a high risk group like having a BMI over 35, being under the age of 60, or having a history of gestational diabetes, your doctor might talk to you about medications like metformin, but lifestyle changes is always the first step. And remember, most people with prediabetes don't even know they have it. That's why screening is so important, especially if you have risk factors like excessive weight, family history, or a sedentary lifestyle. Now, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Are you or someone you care about dealing with prediabetes? If so, what steps have worked for you? Or what questions do you have? Drop a comment below. And thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Family Med.